For thousands of years, mankind has been on a journey to create the perfect society. By about 2500 BC, the Bible has this to say about his failure to achieve this goal. And Yahweh saw that the depravity of mankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was continually evil. Genesis 6.5 It further says of this time, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Genesis 6.11 and 12 Attempts to create an utopia, a society and world free of war, hunger, poverty and racial and ethical conflict, have all failed miserably. From early times, the Bible makes it clear God's intention has never been to allow mankind to form a unified society. In the 21st century BC, a mere 400 or so years after the great flood of Noah that destroyed all life, except for the eight humans and animals aboard the ark, mankind was again attempting to create a utopia. With the earth having an estimated total human population of about one million by this time, the Bible tells us, now the entire earth had one language and the same words, and as people migrated from the east, they discovered a plain in the land of Shinar and dwelt there. And they said to each other, Come, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And so they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower with its top to the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves so we won't be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Genesis 11, 1 through 4. This goal of creating a unified society seems harmless, doesn't it? Wouldn't mankind be more successful working together rather than everyone going their own way throughout the vast earth? After all, with a population of only a million or so, if one traveled far enough, they would likely never see another human being in their lifetime. Why would the Creator have a problem with their attempt to unify? In a nutshell, God had concerns of what could be accomplished with such a unification. He said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have a single language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Genesis 11.6 In addition to this concern, the people were disobeying God's commandment, originally given to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Genesis 1.28 this command was repeated to Noah and his family after they left the ark at Genesis 9-1. So we see, the first attempts at political and societal unification failed due to direct intervention by God. In the midst of their apparent success at building a city and tower, God confused their languages. Due to the language barriers, the people of necessity could no longer function as a unit and dispersed. In more modern times, Mankind has continued its attempt for political and societal unification. With the great empires of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome, far-reaching efforts were made to create the perfect world. Each version, however, was certainly up for the interpretation of those in power, with little to no input allowed from those who could not wield the sword. Upon the backs of billions, with rivers of blood spilled over the centuries, attempt after attempt has been made to force upon the populations a form of government that would, in the minds of the rulers, exceed those that came before and which would never come to an end. But they all did, didn't they? In even more modern times, such leaders as Stalin, Pol Pot, Mao Zedong, Hitler and Mussolini have ruled and were responsible for the deaths of millions upon millions. All of these men fully believed they were leading the perfect government that would better any government that came before. Those who failed to see the value in their rule and government were discarded and eliminated. Today we hear much about such political philosophies as socialism, Marxism, communism, fascism, progressivism, liberalism and libertarianism. There are many political parties that believe they have the answer, such as the Democrats, Republicans, the Green Party, the Labour Party, the Progressive Liberal Party, etc., there is a never-ending struggle between those of a multitude of differing political philosophies about which is the most perfect form of government. But little, if any, progress is ever made to improve society as a whole despite all the effort involved. As a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, it's difficult today to remain uninvolved with the political system. With such issues as abortion, gay rights, same-sex marriage, transgender education in public schools, racism and parental rights, most simply cannot remain silent. 
There is an urgent need to do something, although what that something is often seems elusive. There has been an ever-growing attempt to mix Christianity with politics, almost making the two one and the same. Slogans such as, Jesus is my saviour, Trump is my president, illustrates this perfectly. Some have gone so far as to attribute an anointing by God on certain political figures and have made prophecies purportedly from God over these individuals. Despite these prophecies not coming true, they continue to hold on to the idea that their leader is God's chosen. Yet how it can be that God's chosen has been thwarted from having power is never explained, and the unspoken obvious answer seems to elude them. For the biblical Christian, that is, someone who believes that what is taught in the Bible is the final authority for regulating both their behavior and way of thinking, there are easily understood answers to the confusing, chaotic political world we live in. If we go directly to Jesus' own words and actions, while standing before the Roman governor Pilate and in danger of being sentenced to death by crucifixion, Jesus told him, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. John 1836 Please note, the word world here doesn't mean the earth or the location of earth. Rather, the Greek word is cosmos, which means the order of things. Jesus was telling this Roman governor that his kingdom had nothing to do with the current order of things. If it had, Jesus said, then would he have had servants who would physically fight and struggle for his release from the power of the Roman government as well as the malevolent intents of the Jewish leadership? However, because Christ's kingdom had nothing to do with the political or societal order as it was in his day, he stood by himself, humble, and accepted the painful, tortuous ruling of the Roman official who had been pressured to have Jesus crucified. This stance certainly flies in the face of what many so-called Christian organizations and movements scream out today, doesn't it? Rather than taking the same position as Jesus, that the kingdom and order of things they seek is not found in the current order of things, they insist that God will work through the current corrupt system and will, through political means, enforce his will on society. But how well has that worked? The writer of Hebrews in the New Testament described the faithful of old, including such people as Abel, Noah, Abraham, and Sarah, the mother of Isaac, as being pilgrims on the earth. A pilgrim is one who travels to a foreign place, but who has no citizenship or sway there. The inspired author of Hebrews goes so far as to say of these faithful men and women, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Hebrews 11.13 In order to be a stranger and an exile, one simply cannot claim any right or position within the political system they are surrounded by. A stranger and exile is merely present and must endure whatever situation they find themselves in. The Apostle Paul wrote the following to young Timothy, No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. 2 Timothy 2.4 with this in mind, then, why are there so many supposed Christians who feel the need, even compulsion, to involve themselves deeply into the current political system? Is there any place in Scripture that gives us any hint that the situation in the world will improve over time? Will the influence of proactive Christians in the various levels of political influence cause a positive change? Will ethics and morals improve, and will Christian values win out in the end? Hear again what the Apostle Paul had to say. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. 2 Timothy 3.12-14 It would seem from Paul's perspective that things never were going to improve. Certainly history has had moments where a bit of sunlight has shone through the clouds. However, as a whole, the law of entropy continues to be the norm. So long as mankind rules and makes the decisions on this earth, there is no hope of a righteous society or political system. What is most difficult for many to accept is that God the Creator gives political power to whom He wishes. The person in power may not be the one we deem as the best, however, he or she is the one whom God wills to be there at that time. 
Daniel 4.17 should easily clarify this point. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men, and gives it to whom he will, and sets over it the lowliest of men. Daniel 4.17 Whether it be Donald Trump, Joe Biden, or someone else, whoever is placed into power is the one chosen by God. The apostles knew this well, and for this reason the apostle Paul wrote, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Romans 13.1 for those who wish to resist, he went on to write, Therefore whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Romans 13.2 Although we may not appreciate the stance our political leaders take on various issues, all who claim to be biblical Christians must accept what we are told in the Scriptures. Certainly, we are never to disobey a commandment of God in lieu of obedience to our government. In fact, there have been many in history who have died in obedience to God and in passive disobedience to their governments. However, when it comes to participation in a political system, with the empty hope of changing things for the better, we must take heed to what was written at Ephesians 6.12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, if, therefore, our struggle is against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places, let us place our focus for change upon our God and Jesus the Christ. Our struggle has never been against our fellow human beings. Rather, our struggle is against the one who is called the serpent, Satan, and the devil. It's this character who is said to be the God of this age, and the one who blinds the minds of unbelievers. 2 Corinthians 4.4 in conclusion, the prophet Daniel foresaw a time when the kingdom of the Messiah would finally reign supreme. In the second chapter of the book of Daniel, he interpreted a dream for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. In his dream he saw a great statue with a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, abdomen and upper thighs of bronze, legs made of iron and feet made of iron mixed with clay. These various metals would symbolize different kingdoms. The head of gold was Babylon. The chest and arms of silver would become the kingdom of Medo-Persia. The abdomen and thighs of bronze would thereafter symbolize the kingdom of Greece. The legs of iron would symbolize the Roman Empire. At last, a kingdom would exist that would be symbolized by the iron mixed with clay. Daniel says of this final kingdom, And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. Daniel 2.42 and 43 The prophet Daniel goes on to say, And in the days of those kings, the iron mixed with clay, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Daniel 2.44 In Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he saw a great stone coming from heaven, striking the feet of the statue and toppling the entire thing. Daniel's interpretation of that event was the establishment of God's kingdom upon the earth. With this in mind, therefore, is there any wonder why Jesus told the Roman governor, My kingdom is not of this world. Jesus knew very well that the kingdom he would preside over in the future would completely replace and eliminate all kingdoms presently in power. The question, then, that must be asked is, for those who claim to be biblical Christians, why would you ever wish to participate in a system that is due to be utterly destroyed and replaced?